Amen. Well, as I've said, we have paused our series. If you've been with us for a few weeks, we're walking through this series entitled Day in the Life, looking at the spiritual disciplines. We'll get back and we'll continue that series next week. But this week, we had a monumentous thing happen, which I'll confess my lack of faith. I was totally shocked. In fact, I've been telling people for years this would never happen. Shows to goes to show you what I know and what I don't know. But you have heard already, Roe v. Wade has been overturned. <laughs> That's an answer to prayer over the past 50 years. Who knows how many prayers have been offered, how many hundreds of thousands of hours have been spent in prayer and service and work in order for today to come about. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And so today... What I want us to do is I want us to take some time and look specifically. The title of today's message is, is simply After Row. What do we do now? You see, when we look into this conversation, there's several temptations that are involved that we want to avoid, and there's many opportunities that we don't want to miss. We want to be mindful of where we are going, of where God is drawing us, both as a church, as center point, but then where God is drawing his people, of this grand story that God is telling, of which we get to play just a little bit of part into it. And so, let me say this, and this might be the understatement of the day. The overturn of Roe v. Wade has caused a tidal wave of reaction around the world, not just here in America, but around the world. You see, abortion is one of those topics that absolutely polarizes people. I have yet to meet someone that has a so-called moderate view on the subject. I don't think they make those. It's one of those topics that there's a group here, and there's a group here, and there's what seems like an infinitely large chasm in between them. But... In this story that God is telling, he tells the story of unity, of reconciliation, of redemption, of forgiveness, of new life, and we get to walk right in that together. Now, before we begin this journey of what life looks like after Roe, I want to be mindful of something. Statistically speaking, which by the way, I think Abraham Lincoln once posted on social media that 63% of statistics are all made up, and so keep that in mind. Statistically speaking, it's an almost certainty that I'm speaking today to someone who's either had an abortion, to someone who's pressured someone into having an abortion, something along those lines. And if you're here, and if that's you, let me just say something to you. God loves you dearly. God's grace is for you. Your abortion did not surprise God. He knew he saw, and he is with you today. So often, those who walk through that, who have experienced that, many of them leave an abortion with a lifetime of shame and a lifetime of regret. And then what they do with that shame and regret is the same thing that we all do. We try to find coping mechanisms. We do anything we can to take our eyes off of the shame, and we put it on literally anything else. But the answer to shame, this is universal, no matter where that shame comes from, the answer to shame is Jesus. Amen. He alone is the one, just as we sang, that will welcome us with arms open, that is willing to take our shame and give us his righteousness instead. So often when I speak with or when I hear people talk about abortions they've had in the past, they give many reasons, and these reasons are valid. They're, tri they're not trivial reasons. Things such as, how will I stay in school? Or if someone's a 16-year-old girl and they're pregnant, what are they going to tell their parents? Will their parents disown them? A whole list of things. And we don't trivialize any of that. But what we need, if you've experienced an abortion, if you've pressured someone into having one, what you need is not an excuse, as big of an excuse as that might be, but what we need is an exchange. You see, the Bible tells us this, that God made him, meaning Jesus, who had no sin, Jesus who lived a perfect life, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This great exchange takes place when we come to Jesus, when we give him our shame, we give him our guilt, we give him our regret, we give him our sin. And he takes all of that. 
And in return, he gives us his own righteousness, his own holiness, his own perfection, his own majesty, his own glory. We get to partake in all of that. And so if you're here and if that's part of your experience, God loves you, we love you. Turn to Jesus, for he alone can take away your shame. Now, we do need to move forward, however, and to discuss this issue of abortion as a whole. And as I've said, reactions to this case, which, by the way, is Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization. There is a mouthful that absolutely nobody will remember, myself included. We need to look at some of these reactions and see what's going on. For example, I, I snipped a few of them. Here is a tweet from former President Obama. And he says this, Today the Supreme Court not only reversed nearly 50 years of precedent, it relegated the most intensely personal decision someone can make to the whims of politicians and ideologues, attacking the essential freedoms of millions of Americans. Now, I'm showing you this not so that we can say if we agree or disagree in reality, Everybody kind of knows how they feel about it. But I'm showing you this because this is representative of what millions of Americans are feeling today. And if we're going to connect with them, if we're going to share the love of Christ with them, we need to know where they are. And if we don't know where someone is, we can't connect with them. Another response, this is from Alveda King, niece of the late, great Martin Luther King. She says, for 49 years... We, the people, have had to endure a flawed and unconstitutional ruling from the Supreme Court <clears throat> that allowed unelected judges to create a national right to abortion that ultimately led to extreme actions like late-term abortions against the unborn. Today, the Supreme Court has rightfully overturned that decision, sending the power to regulate abortion back to the elected officials at the state level. I have longed for and prayed for this day, and I will continue to fight for human dignity for everyone, from the womb to the tomb. Alveda reminds us that if we're talking about what it really means to be pro-life, it includes being pro-birth, but it is so much more than that, about being pro-life from the womb to the tomb. Every life has dignity, as we'll see in just a minute. One more reaction I'll share with you. This comes from Pastor, soon to be retired Pastor, but Pastor Rick Warren over at Saddleback Church, and he says simply, ooh, that's small print, I did not think ahead. The Supreme Court, hang on, the Supreme Court has overturned Roe v. Wade, ending the federal support of abortion. Millions of unborn Americans say, thank you. The reactions following this case are wide and varied. There's protests all over the nation. We've had protests in our city in the past couple of days down at the Boone County Courthouse. Abortion is a polarizing issue. But we need to ask this. Jesus invites us into this place to navigate our world with godly wisdom, to look and to see how do we take God's heart and how do we live according to it in this world. You see, there are many things that the scriptures may or may not directly address. We have words today that just simply weren't in existence 2,000 years ago. But what we have access to is God's heart. And so how do we live according to God's heart? And the questions that we have to ask when it comes to abortion are this. When does a child become a person? When is the moment of life? There have been different assignments given to that. When the Bible talks about our very essence as a person, it refers to that as our spirit or our heart. You might remember David praying, Create in me a clean heart, O Lord, and renew a right spirit within me. The spirit and the heart is the essence of who we are. See, we are not a body. We have a body. And so the question is, when does a person have that spirit and that heart? When does that come into being? On a, on a uh, resume out a little bit, another question would be, what is God's heart towards each person? If we've defined when life begins, well, what is God's heart towards life? 
And so what we're going to do today, we're going to look at just a few verses, a few passages of Scripture, and believe me when I say we could stay here all day and not exhaust the subject. God has a lot to say about life. But what I want us to see is that God gives us a grid to think through when it comes to all questions pertaining to life. He gives us some pointers. He gives us this grid that lets us see his heart for this world. So what does the Bible tell us about the value of life and about the timing of life? When does life begin? As an overview umbrella statement, God places an incredibly high value on all life. All through the scriptures, God calls us over and over again to choose life. In fact, Jesus even says that he came so that we may have life and have it abundantly. All through the scriptures, God equates following him with having life. So, what is this grid? Here's a few thoughts on that conversation. The first thing to keep in mind, really simple statement, God creates life. What we could have said but then that is God alone creates life. No one else does, nothing else does. God creates life. The psalmist writes this, know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Centuries, millennia before ultrasound and before prenatal health and all the discoveries we've had about pregnancy, David here said for certain, God is the one who made us and we are his. What this also tells us is that there is no such thing as an accidental pregnancy. Sometimes you hear people talking about they had an accident and now someone's pregnant or the one child was a mistaken child or overlooked or something like that. There is no such thing because God has planned for that child, as we'll see in a moment, from before the foundation of the world. The Bible also tells us, this is what the Lord says, your Redeemer who formed you in the womb, I am the Lord, the maker of all things who stretches out the heavens, who spreads out the earth by myself. Last week when we talked about worship, I encourage you to take a moment, look at the heavens, look at the wonders of God's creation, look at the stars at night, get outside the city. It's amazing how many more stars there are out there when you're not inside the city. Look at all of these and marvel. The same God who created all, all of this, the same God who created all of these galaxies, the majority of which we will likely never see this side of heaven, that same God put together each of us inside our mother's womb. How much value must God attach to each of our lives? So first, God is the one who creates life. Second, God, and once again, I could say God alone, God gives life purpose. God spoke to the prophet Jeremiah, and he said, before I formed you in the womb, before there was a baby at all in his mother's womb, God says, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart, and I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Before Jeremiah's mom was pregnant with him, God knew him. What does that say about who we are as persons, about how great that our God is. Now, so often we make this mistake. We make the mistake of trying to create our own purpose in life, of trying to say, what's my purpose? I'll create my purpose, and this is what I'm going to go after in life. Now, the problem with that is if I create my own purpose, my purpose is only as big as I am. Does that make sense? If I create my own purpose, my purpose can't be bigger than me. It's as big as me. Now, some of us might be rich and famous and whatever else going on, and so they might be bigger than other people in a sense, but their purpose still has limits. You see, we're all limited by what we can accomplish. We're all limited by time. We're all limited by the amount of years that we have on this earth. And so if our purpose is created by ourselves, then our purpose is limited in the exact same way. But instead, when we get God's purpose, 
when we get caught up in what he is doing in this world, now our purpose is as big as he is. It is eternal, never-ending. It is overwhelming. It is majestic. It is glorious, as glorious as God is. Now, why is this important to remember in conversations about abortion? Well, so often... When a woman, when a man pressures a woman, whatever that case may be, to get an abortion, and they explain why, typically it involves something like, well, it's not the right time for me to have a baby. I'm trying to get my career set. I'm trying to get through school. I'm trying to get whatever it is, all valid things. But it's as if they're saying, I'm trying to live this purpose that I have, and that baby will ruin it. Instead, when we look to God, and when we get his purpose in mind, then we begin to see maybe that baby isn't a barricade to living out God's purpose for your life. Instead, maybe that baby is a part of God's purpose for your life, whatever role that might become. And so the encouragement, instead of seeking to create our purpose, seek God. What purpose do you have for our lives? God creates life. God alone gives life purpose. And when we talk about timing, this purpose begins before birth. It's not that when we were born, that's when we have purpose. The act of birth, it's not a magical thing in the sense of it conveys personhood upon a child. The act of birth changes the residency of that child, and they eat a little bit different, and they breathe a little bit different. There's a few things like that. But when we're talking about personhood, when we're talking about purpose, when we're talking about our spirit and our essence, a birth doesn't give us any of that. We've already had it. And the greatest example of this you'll see in Scripture is in the birth narrative of Jesus. You see, when Mary, an unwed teenage single mom, found out she was pregnant in a society that was much, much harsher on unmarried moms, unmarried teenage moms than we are today, she would be one that had been scared to death. And so what does she do? She does what many of us do when we're scared. She runs to her family. She runs to find comfort and protection. She goes to her relative Elizabeth. Now Elizabeth is facing the same situation from a very different perspective. Elizabeth was advanced in years, the scripture tells us. Another way to say that would be Elizabeth... She'd been around for a little while. She's experienced. We'll put it like that. She's past the age of bearing children, and she never had a child. Now, just as their culture would greatly condemn an unwed teenage mom, their culture would also completely overlook a woman and her husband if they did not have children. Children were a sense to say, God has blessed me. I have worth in this culture. And Elizabeth did not have a child But she continued to pray and pray. And then one day God answered her prayer. And just as Mary was pregnant with Jesus, Elizabeth is pregnant with John. And this is what it says about when they gather. And Mary ran to Elizabeth. It says, at that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home, that's Elizabeth's husband, and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. The first person to recognize Jesus on this earth was an unborn child. Oh, that's good. The first person to respond to Jesus in worship was an unborn child. How would that child know that Mary and Jesus are coming? It tells us that the Holy Spirit filled Elizabeth. The Holy Spirit was filling John as well. And we know this for sure. The Holy Spirit fills persons. He does not fill things or non-people or anything like that. John, while he's in the womb, while he's being influenced by the Holy Spirit, while he's knowing that Jesus is coming, John is a person. And notice what Elizabeth says. Why should the mother of my Lord come to me? 
Elizabeth recognizes that child within Mary not will become the Lord one day, not once he is born, then he'll be the Lord, is already the Lord of the earth. The King of kings, the Lord of lords, at that time was an unborn child. Our purpose, it doesn't begin at birth, it begins before birth. According to Jeremiah that we read, it begins long before we were even formed. God creates life. God alone gives life purpose. Our purpose begins before birth. Lastly, at least for today, like I said, we could go all day on these things. Lastly for today, God's heart is to provide for and protect children. Now, more broadly, God's heart is to provide for and protect those who cannot provide and protect themselves. God cares for those who cannot care for themselves. But today we're zooming in on children. We're zooming in on this topic of abortion to see what does God have to say about life itself. And we see this. Jesus made this quite clear. He was teaching his disciples. He was teaching this crowd that had gathered around him. He was trying to explain to them how to get into the kingdom of heaven, what God's kingdom is like. And if you've ever been a teacher, if you've ever tried to lead a book study or a small group or anything like that, sometimes you get the feeling that whatever you're saying, it just isn't clicking. Maybe I'm the only one who's experienced that. Y'all are a lot better teachers than I am. Anyway, sometimes this happens. And so what you do in the moment, you call a little audible. You try to find something to make it click, to make it work. And Jesus does this as he's teaching about the kingdom of heaven. The Bible tells us he called a little child to him. And he placed this child among them. This child, and in the culture of the day, children were considered a gift, and a gift that best keep quiet and stay over there because the adults are trying to do stuff. Okay. Jesus brings that child in. And he says, truly I tell you, not the child, the people that are listening, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Those are some harsh words from Jesus right there. See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. God's heart is to provide for and protect children. He talks about whoever welcomes a child welcomes me. Jesus is identifying with that child, with children in general. Anytime we bless a child, anytime we do anything to help provide for a child, it's as if We're doing that for Jesus himself. God's heart is to protect children. You see that. See that you do not despise these little ones, for their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Now, we said this is God's heart for all who can't care for themselves. Children right here are the picture of those who cannot care for themselves. All over the world, it's a tragedy. And this has happened all through history When an unwanted child is born, their parents, if they don't want to keep the child, nobody else wants the child, will just simply set them out in the elements. And that child quickly dies because they can't care for themselves. It's impossible. They need someone to come and care for them. And God's heart for the lonely, for the helpless, for those who can't care for themselves, for the weak, is that the strong would come and provide for and protect them. Now, there's much more we could say about this conversation. There's much more we could add to this grid, but this will suffice for what we have today. When we think about God's heart for our life, we remember God creates life. We remember God gives life purpose. This purpose comes before birth, and that God's heart is to provide for and protect children, protect those who cannot care for themselves. And we could apply this grid, by the way, to all sorts of different issues. Everything from local problems, local concerns about which ministries to start and support, all the way to global issues such as foreign policy. This same grid applies. But today, 
we're zooming in on this aspect of abortion. What we see from God's word is that the value of life that God gives us is astronomical. In fact, one passage I didn't even bring up. Many of us know it. In Genesis 1, the very first chapter of the Bible, it tells us that God created man and woman in his own image. Now, in the ancient world, kings were considered to be made in the image of God. It was one way that they ruled. You better obey me because I'm made in God's image. And in the midst of that, God speaks, and he says, every single one of us is made in his image. Every single one of us are kings and queens for God. How much value must he place on our lives? We could go many other places in Scripture, but let's suffice it with there. But then we have to ask this question. If God holds such a high value of life, if God calls us to provide for and protect children, how do we interact with people who disagree? How do we interact with people who are passionately, vehemently angry about this decision that came down? How does God call us to treat them and to be with them? Well, a reminder that we must remember is that we do not wrestle with flesh and blood as followers of Jesus. People are not our enemy. We have a different enemy. And instead of wrestling with flesh and blood, what do we do? We focus on mercy and compassion. According to the first one, this is what the Bible says. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against what? Against people? Against people who vote differently? Against people who post different things on Facebook or Instagram or whatever is going on on social media? Who do we take our stand against? Against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Our battle is not against people. Our battle is against the spirits, against the evil one, that though is defeated, is still working today. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. God calls us to stand against the devil's schemes. Over and over again, Jesus calls us. He says, people are not our enemy. We don't fight against them. Now, even if people were our enemy, how are we called to treat our enemies? We bless them. We love them. We seek their welfare. But those who oppose this idea, those who work against this idea of being pro-life, they are not our enemies. Instead, we continue with mercy and compassion. If you were here a few weeks ago, you remember me telling the story about Elisha? Elisha was this prophet of God who was just going about his merry way, going to Jericho. And then this mob of teenage 20-something-year-old boys come out and are basically threatening to kill him. And then... Joshua basically turns to God, calls to God, help me. And God responds by sending some she-bears, and they come and, you know, just kind of disperse the crowd. We'll put it like that. You might remember that story. It's a great one. You don't see it much in in the little children's storybook Bibles. But anyways, what was the point of that passage? When we face opposition, we look to God, and then we continue with mercy and compassion. God protected Elisha. We noticed Elisha didn't try to protect himself. God protected him. And then Elisha went about his merry way, performing all kinds of miracles, caring for widows and orphans, doing all the things that we are called to do. And so when we face opposition, we look to God, and then we continue our ministry of mercy and compassion. Now notice in that sentence, I'm assuming that we've each begun that ministry. I didn't say begin a ministry of mercy and compassion, continue it. That's simply how we live, full of mercy, full of compassion. That's what we're called to do. The temptation that we have is to miss all of this. The temptation that we have is to lash out against people who disagree and mock them and insult them and belittle them and simply forget that they are people 
that they are also are made in the image of God, that they also have all the dignity and worth that comes with being made in the image of God. That's a temptation, a natural temptation that we face. Another temptation that the church has today is we look at this Supreme Court decision and then we say, check that off the list, moving on with life. But this isn't the end of this idea of working for mercy and compassion, of working to support all life. This is only the beginning. You see, and this is the main idea of the message today. The church is needed now more than we were yesterday. God's people are called today to continue to live out and even live out in greater ways the mission of serving this broken world. After row, in this life after row that we have for now, and by the way, we keep praying and we keep seeking into it, Because just as Roe came one day and then it went away, who knows, it might come back again. In the meantime, what are some things that we're going to see in this life after Roe? Well, if abortion is no longer supported, no longer considered constitutional by the federal government, and some states are going to allow it and some states won't, Missouri is one that I think with the exception of medical care in the sense of if the life of the mother is at stake, Missouri is one that has outlawed abortion already. With that being the case, a natural consequence should be more kids are born. Right? Doesn't that make sense? Now, if a child is born that would have otherwise been aborted, statistically speaking, and you know my thoughts on statistics, these parents might not want the child They might want that child, but not know how to care for the child, might not be able to care, might not be able to provide for that child. They might be destitute themselves and wondering, how in the world can I even feed this child? Who's going to step in and support that young woman, support that family? Are we going to take a step back and let the government come in and support them? No. The church... The church is called to be on the front lines of caring for hurting families, hurting parents, moms who want to care for their kids but don't know how, people that need access to just basic goods. The church is the one that should be right there loving them and supporting them. Now, here's a couple ways that we do this here at Centerpoint. One way is that we support an organization, the broad organization, is called Life Network of Central Missouri, but specifically My Life Clinic, which is right in Columbia, Missouri. You might have noticed it's right across the street from Planned Parenthood down. I don't think it's technically on Providence. There's a little road there, but it's on Providence, close enough. And what the things that they do is they provide, at no cost to the client, pregnancy support for women facing unplanned pregnancies, teenage women, older women, anything that's going on, at no cost to them. Now, through your generosity, we're able to partner with My Life Clinic and support them. And also, we have several connections with My Life that you may or may not be aware of. One of our church members, longtime members, Pablo Serna, is on the board at My Life Clinic. That's a big deal. We've got several folks who are here at the church who work there, who volunteer there, who show up to serve these women as they're trying to navigate an unplanned pregnancy. Now, you remember what I said earlier, there's no such thing as an unplanned pregnancy, But from our human perspective, sometimes there is. In the ultimate sense, there is not. But here, sometimes we navigate and we face that. And so we support Mind Life Clinic, the wonderful things they do. Another organization we support, near and dear to our hearts specifically, is Coyote Hill. Coyote Hill has changed, in a sense, their mission over the years. Years ago, you might know this, our family, we lived at Coyote Hill up in Harrisburg. And at the time, there's houses set up and then we would live there, and then kids who couldn't be at home, primarily because they're in foster care, would come and live with us. Now, Coyote Hill has adapted their mission. Those homes are still there, but now they're training foster parents all around mid-Missouri and supporting foster parents. And they're the ones that'll be there at 1 o'clock in the morning if the phone rings, and they'll be there to support. They're there to help provide things that they might need to do everything they can to help a foster family succeed. And if we remember this, right now in America, there are, give or take, 
430,000 children in the foster care system. Here in Missouri, there are around, give or take, 13,000 children in the foster care system. We, the church, the Big C Church, we are called to be on the front lines of caring for those kids. And so we support Coyote Hill amongst other ways that we try to help children who are facing foster care and all of the trauma that comes along with that. Now, one way, just as an aside, if we, since we support these groups, we do this through our Missions and Benevolence Fund. And so if you'd like to participate in that, you can give. If you do a check, right on the memo line, Missions Fund. If you go online to our website, there's a little drop-down window where you can give, and it'll go straight to those funds as well. How else can we celebrate children? Well, one easy way, not easy, one obvious way, that's the word I'm trying to find, that we do here, is Kid Point. Right here, our children's ministry that seeks to share God's heart with our kids. Now, when I speak with Erica, who is phenomenal, a phenomenal children's director, I cannot overstate the job she has done. She's teaching kids right now, go figure. But when I speak with her, one of the primary things about our children's ministry is it needs to be fun. You've heard me say church should be fun. I think that for everything that we do as a church, it should be fun. Our children's ministry especially should be fun. How tragic would it be if a child's exposure to the gospel and exposure to God's heart was in a place that they dreaded going to because it was just downright boring? That's a tragedy, oh church. And so we want to do all we can to make sure our children's ministry, especially church as a whole, our children's ministry is fun. But some questions we can ask ourselves here. How do we view the children right here at Center Point, before service, after service? Do we view them as a hindrance to the ministry? Or do we view them as a vital part of the ministry? Not only as those who can receive the ministry, but even those who can serve in different ways. Children want to help. They want to belong. If you would have been here at 9 o'clock this morning, you would have seen little Ben coming up to Aaron about... 48 times? I think I counted. <laughs> Maybe 49. Daddy, do you need help? <laughs> no. <laughs> Dad, do you need help? <laughs> Still no. It was a beautiful thing. Kids want to help. They want to serve. And so how can we help them experience the joy that comes from serving? What else do we need to keep in mind in this day after row, this world after row? when we have the stark reality that in Missouri, abortions are outlawed, but our neighbor to the east, they are not. Illinois still allows abortion, probably provides some level of support for it. I'm guessing I could be wrong there. And so the reality will be that some women in this state, overcome by shame, overcome by regret, will take their shame and they'll run to Planned Parenthood in Illinois in order to find comfort for their shame. As a follower of Jesus, it hurts my heart, it hurts our hearts, that these women will drive right past how many churches in order to go to a Planned Parenthood to find relief for their shame. What is it that keeps them from thinking, I have shame, I go to Jesus? Jesus is the one who takes away our shame. The church, we are called to create an environment where people can bring their shame, bring their discomfort, bring their troubles, bring their guilt, and place them right here with us. Amen. We are the ones that are called to live out this heart of God, the heart of Jesus that he gives us, the ones who provide for and protect those who cannot provide for and protect themselves. Now, this part of it right here, church, this can be scary. Because when the church, I'm talking about the big, church, big C church, when the church grabs hold of this mission to allow anyone to come, to welcome anyone, no matter where they are in life, to come, to be a part of community, to come and connect, to come and be connected with Jesus, things can get messy. Things get messy real quick. And sometimes we are tempted to want to avoid that mess. But... In the midst of the mess, that's where the joy of God is. That's where our eternal purpose comes in. 
that's worth significance, where we step into it in the grandest way possible as we walk with someone through their own mess and as we look for people to walk with us through our mess as well. God is the God of life. And he calls us to take that, to consider it, to live according to that life that he has. The church is needed more today than we were yesterday. Mercy and compassion are the ministries that God calls us to in a greater way today than we were yesterday. That call has always been there. There's now a whole new set of opportunities to walk through mercy and compassion. How will we respond? How will we, right here in this room, today, extend God's heart to everyone around us? How will we, in this day after row, how will we navigate this world that we have and bring God's heart with us? Worship band, would you come up here? As we close, I want to share with you, for once again, I started off my message and I'll end my message kind of in the same spot. If you're here, if you've had an abortion, if you're considering an abortion, or if your kids are, or your siblings, or your next door neighbor, or coworkers, if we're honest, we all know someone who is, we just likely might not know that they are. Does that make sense? We want to live our lives in such a way that people can share that, by the way. But this topic for us is so vital, and we are so passionate about it for many reasons, but one reason. If you know our story, you know that we found out we were pregnant when I was 17 years old. And at that time, we had people recommend and encourage, just get an abortion, we'll pretend it never happened, we'll move on with life. Now, at that time, even though I, at least, was a raging heathen and wanted nothing to do with God, that thought of abortion still just triggered something within us. And we did not pursue that. Now, I say that because when someone talks about those excuses I mentioned earlier, I can't afford a child, how will I finish school? How am I going to navigate raising this child when I'm a child myself? I bring those up because those were the exact things we were thinking. How are we going to do that? Now, luckily, God brought amazing people in our lives. The church at the time, even though I didn't know the church, the church showed up in beautiful ways. And here in a couple months, our son is going to turn 16. And so, careful on the roads is all I'm going to say with that. But at the church. Once again, if you're considering, if you know someone who is, God loves you. We love you. We are passionate to support you. We want to do everything we can to care for you. We understand the fears. We understand the worries. We understand the regret. And we want to walk with you through all of it. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you are the God of life, that in you, Lord, we live and move and we have our being, that every good and perfect gift comes from you, O Lord, that we owe you thanksgiving upon thanksgiving for all the wonders that you've given us, even though, Lord, we miss the vast majority of them. But God, we are looking to you today so that we can see your works and respond in worship. God, I pray for each person here, each person that is listening to this message. Lord, would you identify for us yet again our own ministry of mercy and compassion? How can we today, how can we walk out your heart and your great love for this world? And God, as we navigate this culture right now that is polarized, as we navigate this issue that will be talked about at least until election day, if not beyond, Lord, would you call your church to be on the front line of caring for the hurting, of welcoming the guilty, welcoming the shameful, welcoming those who are overwhelmed with regret, 
And Lord, would you continue to do all that's within your heart? Would you build your kingdom, God? Would you stand there with open arms yet again and welcome more and more sons and daughters into your family? We pray this in Jesus' name.